My name is Sheree Cabral. I am a senior database admin slash architect at Mozilla. Um, you know, you can get the, uh, the information there. I have a blog at Sheree.com. You can tweet me at Sheree. Um, and also the slides for this talk are at bit.ly slash MySQL backup. So a lot of people want to know, are the slides going to be available? And the answer is yes. They're available right now if you want to follow along. So who am I? Um, I'm an Oracle Ace Director for MySQL. What that means is Oracle has acknowledged that I speak a lot about MySQL and helping the community, and so they'll give me a budget to go to different talks and talk about it. So like I was in scale a couple weeks ago in Los Angeles, which is kind of, it's like the Southwest Linux Fest, you could call it. Um, and so, you know, here I am at the Northeast Linux Fest, um, and, you know, Oracle helps, you know, defray the cost of my travel there. I'm currently working at Mozilla. If you haven't heard of Mozilla, we have this really cool browser called Firefox. Um, and I'm on the IOUG MySQL Council. And what this means is every, um, every month we meet, and then every other month we actually talk to an Oracle representative. So if you were in the last talk and you heard Dave Stokes talk about MySQL Connect, that was really the IOUG MySQL Council saying, look, we're the biggest, you know, most popular open source database platform. We should have our, our own conference by the people who are developing the software, right? There's Procona Live, and that's a great conference, but until this year, um, Oracle didn't send any, any engineers to it. So last year, you know, they were like, okay, well, we'll do MySQL Connect. And they're doing it again this year. They've expanded it. It's a day longer now. So there's, uh, there's two days of sessions and one day of tutorials. So, and that's the URL, iog.org slash MySQL Council if you want to know what we do. So let's talk about MySQL backups. Let's define our terminology. Okay, that's the most important thing. Because if you don't define your terminology, you get into a situation like this. So this is a, a Dilbert comic that I paid to actually get uh, permission to use. It says, I'm pleased to report another stellar week of accomplishments. I moved more than 800,000 bits of data to a disaster recovery backup facility. And then later, Dilbert's asking his coworker, did you just take credit for copying a file to a diskette? And he said, well, it was my resume. So if you're not defining your terms, you're not benchmarking, right? You know, using that kind of stuff, like, you could just, you could say stuff like this and it doesn't really matter. So let's define our terminology. Um, what's a logical backup? A logical backup is something where um, you're not getting any like physical copies of files or anything like that. It's the logic involved. So it's perhaps an SQL statement that says create table or insert into. That's a logical backup. There's also a physical backup which doesn't have those kinds of statements. It has the copies of the files. So it's, it's a physical backup, right? If you're taking the things there, you can't really like look in those files to see what the data is necessarily like you can with the logical backups. Um, and these have implications for when you're talking about restoring a backup. When you restore a physical backup, you restore the files, right? You copy the files over, and then you start MySQL. Maybe you have to change permissions or something, but you start MySQL and it just works. With logical backups, you have to import the stuff. Um, so why would you use logical backups and have that, has that extra step of importing? Well, there's different things you can do with logical backups, and we'll talk about that. You can take partial backups really easily, things like that. Um, a consistent backup. So a consistent backup is used, let's say you have um, a sales table. You have a sales database, and you have a customer table and a sales table, right? So a customer makes a sale. Well, you want to make sure if you start backing up tables, and let's say you don't use a consistent backup, and so first you back up the customer table, and you have up to customer 100, and then you get to the, um, the orders table, the sales table, because you know it's, it's later alphabetically, and all of a sudden you're getting orders from customers number 120 and 150 that aren't in the customer's table you backed up because they were created between those times. That's not a consistent backup. So you want the, the tables the back, and the databases that you're backing up to be consistent within themselves and make sure that if you started it up, it would have a, a point in time kind of snapshot of what the data is. And then there's inconsistent backups, which is the opposite of consistent. Um, a cold backup is when you shut down MySQL, right? MySQL is cold, you cannot use it, right? That's why it's called a cold backup. Um, there's also a hot backup, which is the opposite, meaning MySQL is still up and running while you're taking the backup. Now, this can be, if you're doing a cold backup, if you shut down MySQL, it's very easy to get a consistent backup because all you do is copy the files. Um, it's easy to get a physical backup, easy to get a consistent backup. It's hard to get a logical backup because MySQL is not running, so you can't run an export command. Um, and it's, you can't really get an inconsistent backup unless you change the files while you're doing that. Nothing's changing the files if MySQL isn't running. Now, of course, 
The drawback is you have to shut down MySQL and it's not usable. So um, that can be a problem. There's also what's called a warm backup. So now a hot backup means MySQL's running, it's fine, there's not really a lot of change. Nobody would necessarily notice. What we call a warm backup is maybe there's a little more I.O. going on, you know, the database might become a little slower, um, and you, depending on your system, when you do a hot backup, it might really be more like a warm backup, because there's, you know, if you're doing a lot of file copies or something, there's a lot of disk I.O., so you might notice that things slow down, so you might not want to take your backup at peak time. So, is this lazy backup? Yes? Who says yes? Who says no? Okay. Great. Um, the thing about a slave is that it is, in a way, the promise you can only get now. Right? With a slave. And we'll talk about uh, ways around that. But for the most part, when you just make a slave, you, you can only get now. And so that's great, but what happens if you, you know, drop a table or whatever? You can use delayed replication, so you can say, okay, well, what if I drop a table? Well, let's delay replication by an hour. Okay, that's great. But what happens if somebody did something yesterday and they realized, oh, shoot, I really didn't want to do that. Do you have that backup? And you don't, you only have a slip, right? So you could go, well, maybe we should delay it a day. Maybe we should delay it a week. Like, how long do you delay? And so some people really like delayed replication. My personal viewpoint is if you have a problem such that you think you need delayed replication because people are dropping tables left and right and once a month this comes up, then uh, stop doing delayed replication and just tell people, no, I don't have that backup, sorry, or make it harder for them. Uh, because you're just kind of encouraging this environment where it's really easy to get it, um, and people should really be more careful about their, about what they're doing. Uh, maybe they shouldn't have access on production. Maybe this is something where you can do a delayed replication on the developer uh, machine, the developer or MySQL instance, and that's fine. Um, so the Procurement Toolkit can do delayed replication. Also, MySQL 5.6 has it natively. So if you're using a version of MySQL before 5.6 and you want to do delayed replication, great. You have to use Procona Toolkit. If you're using 5.6 and up, you can either use Procona Toolkit or the native way of doing it in MySQL 5.6. Interestingly, they, use, they do it differently. So you might want to, if you're using 5.6, you might want to actually look to see how Procona Toolkit does it versus how MySQL 5.6 does it because your needs may vary, it may be different. Um, and, you know, of course, the question is how long do you delay? One day, one week, a month, really, how long are you going to do that? Um, it is actually really useful, I found, when you're doing a major upgrade to take one of your slaves, you know, a major upgrade of your code that involves a lot of alter tables, to take one of your slaves, stop it, so that it's a snapshot and an easy rollback if you need it. Um, that's not really delayed replication, right? That's a, that's a temporary stop of replication. So who here has valid backups? <clears throat> Anyone? Anyone? I guess that's why you're here, right? Well, actually, there's no valid backups, only valid restores. Right? Your backup isn't a valid until you store it. In that way, it's kind of like Schrodinger's backup. You don't really know if it's, if it's good or bad until you, until you restore it. Um, so why should you make backups? Um, well, maybe you're doing a database migration or upgrade. So maybe you want to migrate your database to a different server. Maybe you're, maybe you're upgrading, right? When we upgraded to MySQL 5.5, on some cases we take a slave and upgrade it. On, in some other cases, we were upgrading the code base as well. So we moved to a, a newer machine, a better end the machine was old, right? So we moved to a newer machine, and so we needed to restore a backup so that we could get that, that database up and running. Um, analysis reporting. And, and basically what we're talking about is making slaves here, right? We're making a new slave. So we need to, to restore a slave, to restore a backup. Um, so if you have an analysis and reporting slave, you might want to do that. Or you might want to use the backup itself. Maybe you're using a logical backup. Maybe you're exporting the data somewhere so that you can then do ETL and bring it up somewhere else in a different database, maybe a different database system altogether. Maybe you're using Natiza. Maybe you're using you know, something completely different to, um, to do your analysis and reporting. Maybe you're using Excel. Um, maybe archives. Maybe you need to archive your data. Maybe there's some kind of, um, you know, governmental constraint that you have to, like, once a month save your data to make sure that if you ever get subpoenaed, you can get that data back. Um, and for recovery, if you have a disaster, right? That's what most people think about it as disaster recovery. But I can tell you, knock on wood, I haven't had that many disasters, um, but I have had a lot of times where you need to make a slave. So what kinds of recovery can you be when you have disaster? What kind of disaster can you have? 
And I was making this list and I was just kind of like, okay, well, let, let me think of all the situations. So one user's data, right? Maybe you had a user and they said, I want to be taken out of your system. And so you deleted them and they're like, oh wait, no, I want to come back. And can you restore all my settings? Because I was a customer for 10 years. You know, if you don't have that recovery, right? That's going to be hard to do. And this person was loyal for 10 years, left for a month and wants to come back. You really want to get their data from last month if you can, because they were a loyal customer. Um, now, one of the things, the interesting things about this is, do you really want a physical backup of all your data where you'd have to restore the whole thing just to get one user's data? Or do you want a logical backup? Right? You probably want a logical backup if you just want one user's data. Um, if you have data corruption, I've seen this happen a lot um, where, you know, a sector of a disk will go bad or, you know, a block of a disk will go bad and you get data corruption, you know, and it's only a couple of records or maybe it's the whole table or something like that, but, you know, there, this can happen. Um, if there's data loss, same as data corruption, right? If the data is bad or not there, you may need to recover that. Um, how much data can you lose? So a lot of times, you're losing data and you don't even know about it. If you're not checksumming your masters and slaves, you know, in your backup at all, how do you know that it's the same as the stuff on the master? So, um, you know, I think Dave talked a little bit about this last time too. How much data can you lose? Um, and how do you track how much you lose? You know, how many of you have gone to, say, Facebook, posted something, you could have sworn you hit enter, you go back an hour later, it's not there. And you're not like, I can't believe Facebook lost my data. You're like, I guess I must have didn't hit enter. Right? Now, how many of you have gone to the bank, taken out $100, and go back later and say, wait, I thought I could have sworn I took it out. That never happens, right? <laughs> so it depends on what kind of, if you're a bank, right, you can't really lose a lot of data. If you're Facebook, you can lose a bunch of data. If you're Twitter, you can lose a bunch of data. It's okay. You know, if you're a dating site, it's okay to lose a little bit of data. Right? You don't want to do that, ideally, but you have to go to your boss and say, how much data can we lose? And they're going to say, none. Really? None ever? Ever, ever? What if there's like a natural disaster? Won't people understand? Right? When Amazon's EC2 data center went away, people, people understand, like, okay, it's down and that stinks, but they would completely understand if there was some data loss or some, some problems. If it happens every day, right, they're not going to be so understanding. So really, how much data can you lose is a function of how much over time and how many incidents you have. Um, but, but you can lose more data than you want to lose. So who is responsible? Yes, question. Um, another consideration I'm a big fan of is not only how much you can lose, but how much time you can afford to have it missing. So the comment is that you cannot, not only how much data can you lose, but how long can you afford to have it missing. So for example, if you're Amazon.com and you lose somebody's sales records from 2005, you probably could have a long time to retrieve it, maybe a whole month before you can get that data, right? So if that data is on a tape somewhere in some storage facility, that's okay. If you lose my Amazon order from yesterday that hasn't even shipped yet, right, where that's kind of more in an active data set and I might go and look for it, that's a bigger problem and maybe that might be a day or two that I might tolerate of that being lost. Um, so that's an excellent point. So who is responsible for making sure backups happen? Well, ultimately the head of IT, whoever that may be, right? That's their job. It's under IT. And, and ultimately the head of the company, you could say. But really, who is it? Is it the DBA's job to make sure the data is backed up? Um, is it the sysadmin's job? You know, maybe you're doing snapshot backups of your file system. And as a DBA, that might not be something you even have control over. You know, maybe you have a script so that you can kind of um, stop MySQL writes for a split second while the snapshot happens, but you don't really have any control over where those snapshots go or, or how they're done. So does that mean the sysadmin is in charge? Uh, what about a backup service? Do you use a backup service? So do they have any responsibility? What's your SLA with them? What about operators? If you have a data center and you have operators and they're changing tapes, what's their responsibility? Um, what about developers for development machines? Who's responsible for backing up the development machine? Now, I know a lot of times we talk about development stage and prod, and development isn't as important. But as someone, I can tell you, who works for a company whose one of the services is that we provide is things for developers. Right? Mozilla is a very developer-focused company. And while we have about six, 700 employees, and that includes IT as well as the developers, as well as HR and everything, um, you know, most of those employees are developers. And a development machine is production for a developer. Because if your developer database is down, developers can't do any work, right? It's like that, that old saying, like, oh, you know, 
what are you doing? You know, the, the XKCD of having this work. Like, well, you know, the, um, I'm compiling, so it's okay. You know, oh, the database is down, so it's okay. So what do you back up? Do you back some of your data or all of your data? Um, Dave was saying last time, do you really need to back up a list of the United States and their, their abbreviations, right? Because we haven't had a new state in about 60 years. So if you lose that data, that list of Massachusetts is MA and California is CA, you can get that back, you know? It's not that hard, right? But if you lose your private customer's order data, right? If Amazon loses that order data for you, that's harder to get back. You can't just find that on the internet. Do you back up the slave position? So if you're doing a consistent backup, there's one point in time, and if you're doing a backup on a slave, you might want to get that slave's position on the master, so that then you can recreate a new slave that also goes to that master, as opposed to going to that backup that you took. Um, do you record the binary lock position? So if you're, if you're backing up on a master, you might want that position so you can have the, the slave that you're going to build go right on that server that you took the backup from. Um, do you back up any logs containing any commands? Do you back up your slow query logs? Do you back up your binary logs? Your binary logs are incremental backups because they have every single change. So if you do something like you take a backup and you take your binary log position, what if you want to restore to a point in time? Let's say you have someone who dropped a database. And if you don't have a delayed replication, so you're like, okay, I can do this, it'll take a little time. You look in the binary log to see when that drop table happened. You restore up until the statement before that, and then you do a, a table export and import. You know, but you need that binary log. If you don't have that binary log and you just have one backup a day, well, it doesn't really matter that that backup is perfect and works fine because you need up to noon, not 6 a.m. when you do the backup. So you can only get till 6 a.m. Now maybe that's okay. And again, that might be one of these things where you say, look, we back up once a day, and we don't keep binary logs. That's your decision, but know that you're taking that risk that if you actually need a point in time recovery, you won't have it. So um, these kinds of stuff get a whole lot easier in MySQL 5.6 um, with their different, uh, different replication tools, different backup, um, different backup tools. So setting expectations. This is really, really important. Um, it's, is dev backed up? How many people here back up their development database? How many people have a development database? Okay, so you guys aren't backing up your development database. Do your developers know that? Have they ever come to you and said, oh, geez, we really need this? No, you're kind of shaking your head like maybe they have and you had to, have you ever had to tell them, sorry, we don't have that? And they're disappointed, no? Well, you have it, you have? Yeah, well, we, we actually uh, replicate from production, so. If oh, you have the production. So you yes. have backups. We trickle basically. down from prop two. Right, so you trickle down from production to develop it. So their expectation is that they will have a good working database. But and you can fulfill that without taking backups, and that's great. But there, you know, before I came to Mozilla, there were a couple of databases that weren't being backed up, and I saw it, and I was like, well, we should back this up because it doesn't take a lot of this space to back it up. And it was there's just one database that like three weeks after I started taking backups, somebody was like, Oh my God, do you have this database? Because it would be so great if you did. And they didn't know if we had it or not. There was no expectation. And the expectation was, if you have it, that would save my life. And if you don't, well, then I have more hours of work. And for me, this was the ideal situation, right? The worst than ideal situation is when people assume you're backing it up and say, what do you mean you're not backing it up? You know, and you're like, you can point to as many SLAs or whatever that you want, but now this developer hates you for life, pretty much, right? Whereas if you can back it up and you can afford to do that, or you have some kind of way, then your developers right, will hopefully love you because you can recover easily from any problem they have. If they drop a table, you can be like, okay, wait a little while, I'll restore a backup, and it'll take a little while, but they don't have that table back because um, you're restoring for production. So do you make it public, right? Some people don't make it public and then you know, become a hero when they want. But that also means that if a developer assumes you're not backing it up, then you can't be a hero and they, you know, and they find out one day and they're like, oh, I never knew you were backing it up, I was doing all this work. Um, and again, will folks play fast and loose with their data if, if, the, if restoring a backup is easy? Right? So this gets again to what I was talking about, delayed replication. If it's really that easy, you know, are they gonna form good habits? And you, know, you could say, well, it's not my job to make sure everyone forms good habits, but frankly, if you have to go once a week or once a month to restore a table because somebody dropped it, you know, that's time that you could be better spent doing things. 
um, do you have automatic refreshes, right? So you pull down, you replicate from production, but do you ever refresh from production every now and then? Like we do that once a month on some of our things, where we'll, we, have a replica, uh, we have a replica, but then we refresh it once a month. Or we don't have a replica, we should refresh it once a month so it gets the most recent ones. Um, do you do it manually, but it, it needs, but it doesn't need you. So you, you have a button either that you press, or maybe somebody in, in dev presses. Maybe a developer gets to press a button to do a refresh so that you're not even involved. And I say that not because I think you have that, but because I think it's something to think about and consider if you're doing manual backups, where you're like, okay, I've got this scripted, and then whenever they come to me and tell me, hey, I need a, I need a, can you refresh because we just did, you know, major code push and things are different, can you refresh from production? Instead of doing something automated, right, because if you say, okay, we're gonna do it on the first of the month, they might be a little um, confused when it happens because they're like, oh, I didn't realize it was the first of the month. You know, their schedules don't, aren't necessarily monthly. Um, but if it's something that's manual, then when they say do it, you just, you know, run a script and it happens, maybe you should give them the power to run that script. Then it removes you completely so that if you take a day off, you haven't then delayed their refresh by a day. Where are the backups taken? Do you take them on a master, a write master that's in, that's in use? Do you take them on a slave that's being used for reads? Do you take them on some kind of a slave that doesn't affect the end user? So a reporting slave, or an administrative slave, or a backup slave, right? At Mozilla we have, a, we have backup slaves, which for me is great, because I can do whatever I want on those backup slaves. Nobody else uses those but the database team. So there are read-only, there's master read-only slaves, and then there might be reporting slaves or administrative slaves, but those are still, you know, even the reporting slaves, the metrics team uses. And even the administrative slave, there's somebody that's using it. So if I need to run a query that will bog down the system, I can do it on backup. Nobody else cares. So when do you take backups? Um, where they are taken really makes a difference. Um, but if, if you talk about when you're taking it, um, if you're doing it on a backup slave, you can take those backups anytime. Right? So the, the, the when really kind of depends on the where. If you're doing it on a master, you don't want to do it during peak time. If you're on a slave that you know, shows end users, you don't want to do that. And are you, um, are you taking full backups all the time? Are you doing uh, static data like states are backed up less frequently? So when you talk about backups for disaster recovery, what kind of disasters are you talking about? Are you talking about something like a member deletes data or they had a pay status expire, so maybe their friends list gets down from 50 people to 10 people or something, so you're kind of deleting some data. Or a dev admin drops a table or a database. A server has disk corruption. A server has network problems. I was just kind of listing out all of the kind of disasters you could have, and then I wrote down network problems, and I realized network problems aren't, aren't really a problem for data. You're not losing any data, right? The data's still there. You just can't get to it. So that's not really uh, a disaster recovery backup or store issue. Uh, what if the data center blows up, you know, how are you going to get that data back? Um, things that aren't disasters, uh, when you're migrating your data, to your data, so, you know, you're making a new reporting server. That's not a disaster, but you do need a backup for it. So, the backup use, how are you going to use that backup determines the way you're going to back up. So, we talked about member deletes data or pay status. You're going to want to use a logical export so you can filter out what you need. Okay, if you use a physical backup, you're gonna have to restore the whole thing. Uh, with a Percona extra backup, you can do like one table at a time, but you're talking about one user's data, right? So you're gonna wanna be able to kind of grep through for a user ID or something. Maybe you need to grep through 10 tables, but you can do that a whole lot easier with a logical export than you can with a physical export. Um, if you wanna migrate data, you might want a logical export for flexibility. <coughs> if you're doing any ETLs on that, um, if you're exporting it um, and going to import it into a different database system, you might want a logical export. Um, you might also want a physical backup if you're just migrating, if you're not mine, so migrating is kind of like you're changing it somewhere along the line. Um, if a dev admin drops a table or a database, you probably would want a logical export for EnoDB. You can use Percona tools for that, um, but uh, tables are usually not a big deal to do a logical export on. Um, it's really not hard if you have something like a backup slave to do a physical backup once a day and a, a MySQL dump export once a day either. So you can have both. There's nothing that, that says you have to use one or the other. You can use a hundred different ways to back up your data depending on how you want to use it. Um, if you have MyIsom, you can actually do a physical export. You can use MyIsom hot copy. Um, and if you want to do a full server recovery, 
you want a physical backup. So whether that's because you're upgrading or, or migrating. Um, are you backing up your configuration files? That's a big one. What happens if your data center blows up? You really need those configuration files. I mean, maybe you might get a new server with a different amount of memory, but you're still going to want to know how big was your sort buffer. If you changed it for some reason, whatever parameters you changed, you're going to want to know what that was. If you've changed your auto increment offset, for example, because you have a master master, you're going to want to remember what that was. And if you don't have the file in front of you, are you really going to remember it? Um, what if you're doing a point in time recovery? Well, you want a physical backup, but then you also want your configuration files, and you also want the binary logs. As I was saying before, that's how you get up to a certain point from when your backup was taken to that point. So how do you do logical backups? I know everyone was kind of waiting for this information, and I, I've defined terminology for about 25 minutes here, but, um, but you know, I think it's important because you might have otherwise, you might be like, well, I don't need logical backups, I only do physical backups, and now you might be thinking, well, maybe I should do logical backups too, just in case. Um, disk space, you know, depending on the organization, right, disk space is cheap. You may not have disk space and that's your own consideration, but for the most part, that's, that's one of the easier things to get is, is something like a replication server where you just have a ton of disk and, you know, maybe you keep it for a week or maybe you keep every month for six months and then the last seven days, something like that. Um, so how do you do with logical backups? Well, one way is to do select into out file or select into dump file. You can use a CSV table and use MySQL dump. And I'll go into these in more detail. So select into, you just select into dump file. Uh, that has no format. I mean, it's not even, it doesn't even separate the fields. Uh, and it only gets one row. I don't know why they did this. I'm assuming there's some kind of internal thing in MySQL that uses this. Uh, or you can do select into out file that has, you can use fields escaped by. So you can escape <coughs> with like quote or something and fields optionally enclosed by and lines terminated by. Um, and you know, you can go to the, the manual page for select into to see stuff. And well, I'll have some examples actually. So here's just some examples. So here's select star into dump file from Here's and here's a dump file name. And then you get an error saying, oh wait, there's more than one row. Right? So I don't know, again, I don't know why select into dump file was even, is even a thing. Right? But there you go. So let's remove that file and try it again with a limit one so that it actually gets there. Okay. And uh, let's look what the file looks like. It looks like this. So it's 1, Penelope, Guinness, 2006, like there's no formatting at all. There's nothing that delin delineates the file, like 1 is the ID, Penelope is the first name, nothing that actually separates those. That's what it looks like. Um, and so here's what the actual row looks like. So you can see that there's no formatting. Um, select into out file, on the other hand, um, and you can see I put it into a file .tab. That's because I know that by default it's tab delimited. So I could change what the, what the files are um, determined by, uh, files enclosed by. You know, if I wanted to make it commas and make a CSV, I could do that. And so, you know, let's look and see what the file looks like. It looks like this, right? So now all of a sudden we're seeing it's tab delimited um, files. So when do you use select into? Um, well, first of all, select into dump file and you probably would never use. Um, maybe you would, I don't know. But select into out file when you only want certain fields. This is the only way that if you, let's say you have a huge blob in, uh, in MySQL, it's like a JSON object. I don't know why people do that, but they do. And maybe you don't want to back that up. Maybe that's something that you don't care. Maybe it's something that you can easily recalculate if you need to. And so you really don't want to back that up because it's going to make your backups huge. Um, the only way to do that is to select into. Um, if you want to join tables, like let's say you, you're doing some kind of a backup for like a subpoena and you, instead of giving it like different files for the user ID, you want to join tables and just give them like one row with all the data. You can do that, with, but only with selected that in two. Um, and it's usually if you're, if you're going to use it for something like a reporting migration where you want to do the ETL as you're extracting it, you want to do that. Um, you know, another real world case is if you're sanitizing data. Like you're taking your production data, you're putting it on your dev instance, but you don't want all the email addresses to be there because what if they accidentally email all the people on your list? Um, you might not want to do that. So select in a dump file, not used very much. So problems to select into, it's only one query at a time, right? So if you do want to do every single table, but you don't want to join them all together, um, it's going to take a while. You need to lock tables if you want consistency. 
and it does not back up the binary log position. Now, if you lock the tables, you can say, you know, show master status, show slave status to get the bin log position and the slave position, but that's another thing in your script to do. It doesn't like back up slave status. Restore can take a long time because it's a logical export. Um, select will make a shared lock, and by shared lock, I mean read lock. Um, so if you're selecting, if you're doing a selected out file on a large table, and you're, you know, you want every record, it's going to lock those records. Um, writes can't happen while you're doing that. So if you restore from selected out file, or really any other data file, you know, you have to use load data in file. Um, and again, it has very similar fields, fields escaped by, fields option closed by, lines terminated by. Um, you might have remembered that from when we were talking about selected out file. So it, you know, they're complements to each other. Um, so here's how you would back up and restore the CSV table. So first you create a CSV table. So let's just give it something that has a name and a claim to fame. And you can see here we have engine equals CSV. Um, and then we insert into the table a few values. So, you know, my claim to fame is this talk. Um, Neil Patrick Harris is an actor slash magician. And Jerry Narvala is in the Our Skill podcast co -host. So we have some data in there now. Okay. So let's look and see what happens in our data directory. What do we see? This test underscore CSV table. <coughs> so we have a test CSV dot CSM, so it's a table definition file. We have the CSV itself, which is the ASCII test, text, and then the FRM, which is the table definition file. So let's look at the CSV file and see what it looks like. Well, here's what the CSV looks like. That looks like kind of how you want a CSV to look like, right? So. The benefit of using a CSV table is it's a hybrid logical physical backup, which means it's a physical backup because you copy the CSV file, but it's actually uh, it's a it looks like a logical backup because it's a CSV, but you don't need to you don't need to load it in. The way that you load it in, quote unquote, is by copying the files around. Um, so you can copy the CSV file. It's a low impact to the server because you're not doing all those inserts again. Um, and there are multiple ways to uh, restore things. So you could use a load data in file if you really wanted to. So the gotchas with using a CSV table is that CSV doesn't actually support everything. Um, there's no auto increment primary key, for example. So I wouldn't say use this on all your tables. Um, you can only do one table at a time, just like selected to. Uh, I'm sorry, not like selected to because there's no joins. Um, and the logical import, if you decide to do it, can be tedious. And the physical import still requires a test table. So let's take a look at how to restore a CSV table using a physical file. So first you have to create the table. So let's create table test2 CSV with the same things, varkar 50 not null. Uh, so we create it and then we copy, so this is me, I did it like on my local machine. I went to my data directory, I copied the test CSV to test2 CSV. And, uh, and then you start it up and you look, then you can look at it. And you can do that while it's running. Any questions about CSV? All right. So let's talk about MySQL dump. MySQL dump is really what most people use for a logical export tool. It's, it's the work for us. Yes. One, and I've never run into it, but it just occurs to me. What happens if your data has a comma in it? What happens if your data has a comma in it? Um, that's why it has fields enclosed by, right? So if you see, when we go here, you can see that Shiri Cabral is in quotes, this talk is in quotes. Because it's enclosed by quotes, if you have a comma in your data, like it was Shiri, comma, Cabral, it knows that it's enclosed by it. So, and then the other thing is you can, you can test it yourself, too, with this kind of simple and, and example. And there's a mechanism for quoting quote marks. So you yes, quote you can it. escape, it, it will escape quote marks, and it will also escape uh, nulls with a backslash n. Did you have a question? Same question. Oh, okay, great. Um, MySQL dump is pretty much the workhorse. Um, it has a lot of flags to it. I'm not gonna tell you about every single one of them. I'm gonna tell you about the ones that I found most useful and I think most people do. Um, dash dash fields terminated by. So again, if you really want a logical export and you wanted some kind of like CSV format or something, you can do that with MySQL dump. You just cannot change which fields you're using. Right, with select into, you can select three of the 10 fields. Right? If you're using MySQL dump, there's no way to change which fields. You're going to get every field in the table. But you can use fields terminated by, fields to be closed by, fields optionally closed by, fields escaped by, and lines terminated by, if you really want. Um, so if you're like, well, select into looked good, maybe I'll use MySQL dump and select into, 
Well, if you want all the fields of a table, you can just use MySQL DOM. So it does kind of look like select and two. You can also have a dash dash XML if you want to export it in XML format. Because XML is pretty much a well-formed database anyway. Um, so here are some MySQL dump defaults. By default, it will lock tables. Um, by default, it does the thing that says dash dash quit, which means it doesn't buffer it and goes directly to standard output. Um, what does that mean? That means if you're MySQL dumping a large table, instead of saying, OK, I'm going to like kind of put this batch into a buffer and then write the buffer out periodically, it just goes straight to standard out. Um, I think that's faster. You know, there's, there's nothing um, extra going on. That's why it's called click. Um, there's also dash dash extended insert. So by default, MySQL has this thing called extended insert where you can um, insert into a table uh, several things. In fact, I think I did it over here when I was inserting into this table here, right? See where I did one insert statement and I inserted three rows into it. That's an extended insert, right? I didn't have to say insert into the table these values. Now, the second statement entered into these values. The third statement entered into these values. Just it's separated by a comma, all the values, right? You put it in parentheses and separated by a comma. That's an extended insert. Um, so by default, that's what MySQL dump will do. So with MySQL dump, you can choose what to back up. Now, you can't choose what fields to back up, like I said, but um, you can choose what databases and tables to back up. So if you want to back up one table at a time, you can loop through and say, okay, MySQL dump DB table. You'll only do that one table and that one database. You can do dash dash all databases, which will do all tables, all databases. You can do dash dash databases with a comma separated list. So if you want to do dash dash databases A, comma B, comma C, you can do that. <laughs> you can do a list of tables too if you want. You know, you just you you have seven databases and they all have the same tables in them because maybe you're an ISP and so every customer gets a database but it has the same tables in it. Um, you say, well, I want to export this table name from all of the databases. Um, you can also do events, routines, right, store procedures, um, triggers. MySQL dump output. Um, you can actually just say, you can say dash dash result file. Most people just redirect to standard output with the, with the greater than sign. So you basically do MySQL dump, say dash dash all databases, and you can say dash dash result file equals foo.tar or foo.sql, for example. Um, or you just do greater than foo.sql. Dash dash master data, um, that will give you the master position. You, there are different options for this, so by default it's not on, and you can set it to one which gives you the, uh, the binary log position, and if you set it to two, it'll comment out. It'll give you the binary log position, but comment it out. Um, because again, this is something that you're gonna import. It's an SQL, it's a file of SQL commands. So what you end up doing is you import it, and so if you have that master data, and you have that change master two in it, it's gonna change it at the end of the file. You might not want that. So if you wanna comment it out, we say master data equals to two. Um, you can say dash dash dump slave, which is similar to master data, except it shows you the slave position. <coughs> MySQL dump tweaks, um, there, there are a bunch of tweaks that you can do. Dash dash no create info won't give you the create info for tables. So if you're doing something like you just want to look at the, the data, you can do that. Uh, if you don't want the data, you, want the, you just want to compare schemas, for example, you do dash dash no data. Um, you can also do insert ignore. So by default, the MySQL dump will do a create table statement, and then it will insert the data with insert statements and the extended insert. But maybe you have something where you're just like, well, I just want to reinsert all this data, but if it's already there, I don't care about it. Right? It has a primary key. You can actually say dash dash insert ignore, um, and I think there should be a dash between insert and ignore there. And it will, instead of making insert into, it will say insert ignore into. Um, you can also do the same with replace. So instead of saying insert into, it will say replace into. Dash dash single transaction will do the whole thing as a single transaction. Um, so if you're using EnoDB or transactional storage engines, it will actually you know, start a transaction and do a MySQL dump. This is a way of getting a consistent export without really having to, to actually just lock everything. You're doing it as a transaction. If you want to restore, like I said, you just import it. You can do MySQL less than backup.sql, um, or you can import text files as you do with select into. So if you're doing, um, you know, you can do a whole bunch of things where the fields are enclosed by this, and you know, if you, if you export it that way, then you can import that way. So what are some gotchas about MySQL dump? Uh, lock it, right? So by default, you, you lock things, right? Because it has the table locks by default. And 
when it's doing a select, because that's what it does, if you actually look in the process list, it's doing a select uh, from the tables. So by default, it, you know, it will do locking. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a hot backup, but it's locking some of the tables. So we call it kind of a lukewarm backup, right? It's a warm backup, but you're kind of locking the tables, so you can still read from it. Um, and logical imports take time to import. Physical backups, right, are a file copy. Um, the most popular way to do it is extra backup, which is from Perfona. Um, it is a free open source tool. Um, and there's also MySQL Enterprise Backup, which you pay for. Um, and there's other things like CMAN and things like that, but you know, there's only 20 minutes left in the presentation, so I don't want to well, actually cover less than that, because in 20 minutes the next lecture starts. Um, so, file copy, let's talk about that. Uh, it's a cold backup, so you shut down MySQL, copy the files over, and it'll work. The cool part is if you have a backup on one operating system, usually you can move it to another one. You can take a Windows backup and move it to a Unix file system and it will work. Um, the way to know if it works or not is, is if it's the same Endian. So if both machines are little Endian, it will work. If both machines are big Endian, it will work. If one is little or one is big, it won't work. Um, but pretty much, um, I've never, I've, I've done this before where like sometimes I accidentally blow away the MySQL directory and, and so I'll just copy, you know, a new one from, you know, my laptop. And you know they're different platforms, and it's okay. So that, that's pretty cool that it will just work, and you don't have to worry about that physical file copy. Yep. That's an interesting thought. But how do you know? How do you know if something's a little Indian or big Indian? Yeah. I don't know. I've just tried it before. I mean, when you know, in your organization, how much are you really changing between vastly different things? If it's not Spark or Power PC, you're fine. If it's not Spark or Power PC, you're fine. He says. I'm sure you can look up. How do I know if my system is a little Indian or big Indian? So. Um, you have a, a file on the backup. Often the file is more important than this. The the tool file. If you do like file backup.sql, it will. Or backup dot whatever. Yeah, it's sometimes he's saying it sometimes reports endings. Yes. Can you get around that by saying you're trying to do a uh, do an import over netcat or some crazy? Can you do that? Can you get around that by trying to do an import over netcat? No, because it's how it's. You mean you're 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 shutting down MySQL and just copying the file. So it's how MySQL stores the file on disk on the different Indian systems. Um, rather, yeah, I, I didn't ask that well. What if you were to take a do a MySQL dump, uh, stream it quick, netcat to another to a an exported file system that was on? Right. So if you if you um, stream a file that's if you're MySQL dumping and you can pipe that into a command to stream it, uh, MySQL dumps a logical backup, mm -hmm. so th that works on anything. Okay. So if you're this now we're talking about just we're talking about copying files like the exact files in your MySQL directory. If you copy them, you can do that, um, but only the same ending to each other. If you're using a logical backup, anything goes. That's that's one of the benefits, right? Because it's just the logic, right? If you're using something like um, selected DAO file or using MySQL dump to get a tab separated or comma separated values file, you can import that into Excel. You don't. It doesn't matter because it's just logic. Right? So when you're talking about the ending thing, it's only literally copying the files over. If you're using other tools, um, that's, that's a different ballgame. So the thing about file copy is consistent because nothing is hopefully, when you shut down MySQL, hopefully nothing's changing the file system under, underneath. Um, and it's easy. All you have to do is copy. You know, you can rsync, you can copy, you already know what to do. You, if, you're, if you've ever, you know, backed anything up from your home computer, you can do this, right? You shut down MySQL, you copy the files, however, and you do it. Maybe you're copying locally, maybe you're copying it remotely, but you're doing it. Um, so how do you do it? You shut down MySQL, you copy your archive files, maybe you do a tar instead of copying, um, and then you start MySQL. Boom, you're done. Um, and which files do you copy your archive? Maybe you also want to copy the master.info file, which has information about the slave position. You might want to also copy some binary log stuff. I mean, it's up to you. So the problem is that it requires shutdown. And you can't just do this on your right master, you know. Um, and make sure to grab all the files you need. If you need the configuration file, grab that. If you need the master.info file, grab it. Because once you start MySQL again, that master.info file is going to start catching up and changing. Um, you don't necessarily need all the files in the data directory. If you're doing a point-in-time snapshot, right, you're copying the files, you don't need the binary logs because that's telling you what changed before you shut down. But you have the data in the files, so you don't need those. 
So if you're keeping a week's worth of binary logs in your backup, and you don't have a lot of disk space, you might want to consider not backing up those binary logs. Uh, extra backup. So this is a you know, free open source tool from Bracona. Um, there you go. And it backs up EnoDB and ExtraDB. Question? Can we go back to the last slide about the file? Can we talk a little more about the restore? Or are you going to Oh, you want to talk about the restore? Uh, how do you restore from file copy? Well, how do you restore from file copy? Great question. I don't know if I go back, go into that. Um, I think I don't, because the, the restore is you copy it to a new data directory, maybe on a new server, and then you start up MySQL. That's one of the advantages that's really easy. Just copy and place and do it. So extra backup, you usually use an Eno Backup X wrapper script because extra backup will, co will do copies of EnoDB or ExtraDB, but um, a lot of the file, uh, a lot of the system tables and databases are my ISO, so you still need that kind of component. It's based on the older EnoDB hot backup. Um, it's a warm backup. So basically what it was is I think it was just a reverse engineer of the old EnoDB hot backup, which they rewrote and is now MySQL Enterprise backup and is completely different. Um, this is a Perl script and, and you know, it works great, um, but the new MySQL Enterprise backup is actually written in C or C++ and it's more native than, than this was. So how extra backup works? Extra backup is a physical backup. You can stream or copy to a remote host directly if you want. So one of the things about a physical backup is if you have 100 gigabytes and your database is 75 gigabytes, you can't just make a local copy unless you're doing some compression. So with extra backup, you can stream it directly to another machine. And I do this all the time. If I'm making a new slave, there's no point in me making a backup of, a, of you know, an existing slave and saying, OK, now copy it over. I can stream it directly. And you can use Netcat to do that if you, if you don't want the SSH overhead. You can do full backups. You can also do incremental backups. Um, I usually don't bother with the uh, incremental backups of extra backup because I just copy the binary logs, but it can be useful if you only want to use one command or if you want to have you know, a set of scripts that use the same toolkit. Um, it can be really useful to do incremental backups with extra backup. You can backup or restore individual partitions. You can backup or restore individual databases or tables. Um, and you can do it by regular expression, which is pretty cool. You can have a compressed backup. Um, there are easy recipes to follow on the website. Um, and you can specify to use multiple threads if you want, so things will go a little faster. That, of course, will cre increase the I.O. load. So I said these were a warm backup. If you use uh, multiple threads, it's going, to be, it's going to get colder and colder, right? Because you're putting more and more I.O. on it. But that's because you're doing more work. If you have a backup slave, that's not a big deal. If you're doing this on a production master or slave or, or a machine that other people are using, you have to think about when this is going to happen, you know, who is going to uh, interfere with. But you can also throttle the IOPS. So you can actually give an upper limit to the number of IOPS if you want. So here's an example. Let's make a new slave. So how are we going to do this? On the slave, right, this new slave that we're making, you install MySQL, you set up my.cnf, you know, very easy to do. You just, you know, run the package, whatever. Then you start listening with Netcat. I like to use Netcat, but it's not secure. So if you're doing this on, say, Amazon RDS, or yeah, Amazon uh, AWS, and you're having, um, so you're doing this on Amazon AWS, and you want your, to stream your, you know, some other slave, some other slave or master or machine, uh, people can see that that network traffic. So you might want to be careful about using Netcat. Um, and then you extract with tar because you're going to stream with tar. So you do something like this, nc-l9999, that says listen on port 9999, and what you get, pipe that into tar xfi dash. And why this? This is the command that you use because when we stream it, the format that we stream it in is in tar format. And if you do it this way, right, you could just um, export it into a tar file and then untar your file. But if you're talking about something that's a big database, why would you do all the extra work to archive it and then unarchive it when you can stream it directly to the to the archiving process. And what will happen after this happens is that your data directory will look exactly the same as where you copied it from, as opposed to having untar it to look at it. So on the master, now, so you started listening on the slave, but you have to send stuff now to the slave. So on the master, or wherever you're taking the backup from, stream this backup to the slave. So here's how you do it. Eno backup x, dash dash stream equals tar. That's why we use tar. Pipe that into nc, the slave name 9999. 
So basically what you're saying is take an email back of X, but instead of putting it where you would normally put it, pipe it into the netcat to send to this machine on port 9999. And you wait a little bit, you know, 10 minutes, an hour, five hours, however long it takes, um, you know, which depends on your network traffic and depends on how fast your things can write and untar and, and do that. Um, and then, once you're done and you have that, you have to usually, um, usually they're doing this as kind of like root or something, but you, so you have to change the files to make sure that they're owned by MySQL. So you usually do that. And then I'll just say you apply blocks. So what happens is, when you're doing a physical file copy, you know, you're copying file A and file B at different times. So what extra backup does, it says, okay, we were at this position when we copied this file. And then we were at this position when we copied this file. So we have to apply all the logs between there to that table. And the first table we did, right, is farther behind than the second table we did, which is farther behind than the third table. And so it's keeping the logs for all that time. So then you have to apply the logs to get it to be consistent. So you go into your, you know, Varlet MySQL. Um, you do eno back of x apply logs dot right into your new data directory, and that's it. Then you show it MySQL and you start MySQL, and that's it. It's, it's really that simple, and this is, I, I took this from the process I use at Mozilla, and I didn't cut anything out of it. Um, and then there's a file called extra backup bin log info, which has the binary log file and position of the master. If you wanted to do um, a slave that was already a slave and make another one that was just a copy of it, you would, um, in the you know, backup X on the, mass, on, the, on the slave that you were taking the file from, you would also do dash dash slave info. And that would put the slave info into a file called extra backup slave info. Um, and that you would, you would use to make the right position. There's also um, Zmander Recovery Manager. I think I said I wouldn't talk about this, but I guess I lied. Um, it can do full and incremental backups. Um, it can schedule backups. And it's logical or physical backups. So how does it do this? Well, the, the answer is in the title. It's a Zmander Recovery Manager. So it manages this stuff, and it gives you the interface to see it. Underlying, it'll still use MySQL dump or you know, backup X. Like, it still uses, it doesn't have its own backup software. right? It's just a good interface into it. But it really works well for being able to schedule things, having a, a central console to say, what, what do my backups look like? Can I schedule a backup? And here's what I schedule the backups, and here's where I keep the backups, and show me when the last successful backup was in one centralized place, as opposed to have to go in to every machine to do that, or to have uh, cron scripts email you, and then you have to go through those emails. Um, Zmander Recovery Manager is really, really good for that. Um, it can do compression, it can do encryption, which is kind of useful because your backups have all your data in it, so you might want to think about encrypting them. And then it can notify you via email or you know, some kind of RSS feed, so you can subscribe to the RSS feed and look at it once a week to see what it's like, as opposed to those emails which happen you know, at once and they end up shoving off to some other folder. Um, and you can also monitor your backups and browse them. So it's really cool when somebody's like, oh, what's the last backup you have for this server? You can go and you can say, oh, it was last week, or it was yesterday. So it's pretty useful. You can define retention policies. And you can do a full recoveries or point in time recoveries. You can do binary log management and parsing right through the recovery manager. Um, and the recovery manager has, there are some, some features are free, and some, there's a community version that has some free features, and then there's an enterprise version where you pay for some features. Uh, but it's pretty reasonable. There's MySQL Enterprise Backup, which can do full or incremental backups. You can back up tables or databases. <coughs> um, it supports both hot backups and cold backups. You can do full restores, you can do point in time restores, it can be multi-threaded. So very similar to, to extra backup in the, in the feature set. Um, it's a whole lot easier to do a lot of the stuff because it's there's more of an interface where you just say, okay, give me a point in time restore to this point in time, and it just goes. With extra backup, you have to, you know, restore certain things, and you have to figure, figure things out. And again, it's a time versus money problem, right? If you want the really easy thing, you pay for it. If you don't want to pay for it, you have to spend a little more time doing it. Um, and it can do compressed backups. Uh, MySQL Enterprise Backup is really interesting. It uses checksums to detect corruption which would be really awesome right, to have because you want to know very soon if your backups worked or not. You know, extra backup doesn't have that. Um, it has faster and smaller backups than, than, the, other, uh, than the other tools. Um, it doesn't, because it doesn't have any unused blocks. So if you have an unused blocks and you have fragmentation in your, um, in your files, MySQL and Enterprise Backup won't actually back those up. 
It can do consistent backups, um, and so other backup methods in the last couple of minutes, you can do disk snapshots. So if you're using ZFS or LVM or Amazon images, you can do that with MySQL. Um, and there are some, if you just Google search how to do it, you'll see people will be like, do this, do that. Because you do have to lock the tables for the split second while the snapshot, right, while you take the snapshot. Because taking a slap snapshot is a split second. So you have to make sure that it's, if you want a consistent backup, that's going to happen. Um, and that's, that's it. Um, if you have any questions or comments, let me know. I do a weekly podcast called Our SQL. I wrote a book called The MySQL Administrator's Bible. Um, if you're interested in learning MySQL from the ground up, um, there's an O'Reilly book called Learning MySQL. And what uh, MySQLMarinate.com does goes through each chapter one week at a time. There's forums and stuff for help. You submit homework on GitHub because there's, there's uh, exercises at the end of each lesson. I mean, it's really a good way if you're like, I know nothing, I want to learn how to query, I want to learn how to administer it. Or if you know one and not the other, you can skip the chapters you do know. Um, or you can read them and, you know, maybe learn one or two things that would be really easy. Um, and we're starting up a new um, season, April 15th. So this season's about to close at the end of the month, and then April 15th we'll start it. So for the cost of whatever learning MySQL is, you can probably get it used. Um, you know, by $30, whatever the book costs, you can do this. And it's, it's totally free. You go to myschoolmarinate.com and you'll, you'll probably see the current season. I haven't put up the new one yet because we're still on the old one. Uh, but you can do, it's, it's basically just a um, meetup group. So you can join the meetup group and, and then you learn about when the next season's going to happen. Planet.myschool.com is great for um, all of, it's an aggregated blog planet of a blogger. So if you do know a little more about MySQL, it's kind of like it's kind of like a trade magazine. If you know nothing about bicycles, you start to get a trade magazine about bicycles, you're not going to know half the stuff in there. But as you learn more and more and more, more of it's going to make sense to you. So that's kind of the same thing about planet MySQL. If you if you're a beginner, um, you look at it and and some of it might make sense and some of it might not make sense. That's okay. Um, any questions or comments about backups?